fantastic. Hello, everybody. Welcome back again to so many of you. And look, I see Max is about to join us as well. Max, who is the light of our lives. Max, we can't manage without you. Good, good morning, madam. Good morning. You are, are the best. And the wonderful Susan has joined us from a beautiful evening in New York City. Good evening, Susan. Oh, do I get a hi? Oh, can I demute you? Hi, everybody. We are thrilled to see you. We miss you when you, we don't see you, Susan. It's fantastic to have you as part of our journey. Our other wonderful Susan, Susan M from Jamaica, has joined us in very provocative and accurate colours. Thank you for joining us in those colours, Susan. That's helping me a lot. And beautiful Linda. Oh, yeah. You're the best, Susan. And beautiful Linda has joined us in the middle of the night from the legendary Finland, the nation where we would all like to be, have been born and to work and to spend the rest of our days and die in Finland. Um, thank you, Linda. So colleagues, welcome to Right Club. And I will also do a big shout out because we've had a lot of comments this week. A big shout out to all our friends who join us on Saturday morning and Sunday morning. Big hi to Vic, big hi to Catherine, all our friends who they sort of join us a day late or two days later. You are very precious to us. You are part of Right Club. So colleagues, let's begin. We've got some hard, hard yakka to do here. 29 minutes. Max has gone, come on, let's do this. So, Max, let's do this. 29 minutes. See you on the other side, Max. Take no prisoners. Come on, Max. Come on. See you soon. Good on you, Anvita. Give it to me, girl. Come on.
last minute colleagues. And colleagues, we are done. My my goodness me, that went quickly. Wow, 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 wow. We'll start with our favourite biker chick, Lorraine. Good morning. You've dressed for it, so we'll start. Good morning. With... Thank you. I'm so glad you came to me first because I have a burning question now. Oh, <laughs> so From our other group, it was just fabulous. And what came out of that was talking about some li limitations around your actual study. And I'm sitting thinking, mm, limit. And I thought, actually, there is a, a limitation that, that's come to light in write, forming and writing up my chapters. And one was using my interview guide, which was a semi-structured interview guide. So obviously you prepare that before you do your interviews. So then when you're actually post-interview and writing up your chapters, you go, oh, I wish I'd have delved into that a little bit more. So that's where I'm really seeing that. Uh, because obviously you're a little bit nervous when you're, you're interviewing people, you know, and I was being really mindful of the conversation, not directing anywhere that could potentially um, trigger any PTSD or, or, you know, so I've been quite cautious. But so that's what I've just been writing this morning, a note to myself around certain themes that I could have potentially explored more. Um, and I'm now going to ask my question is... Yes. Do I put this in introduction and conclusion and in each chapter where it may be relevant? Yeah, look, I put it intro, I put it conclusion, certainly big, big wash your hands in it in the conclusion, have a whole heading and go for it, Lorraine. And right. look, even in methodology, I would be prescient that this matter is coming, Lorraine, and stay. Yeah. The issue with semi-structured interviews and the issue with ethics clearances, and we're desperately needing ethics clearances, it is that... We have, to, we have to be prescriptive to avoid trauma and PTSD yeah. and all the rest of it and, and to be an ethical, decent human being and not poke people when they're down, punch mm. down. The consequences of that is the richness that could have been gained from the data set in the old days of sort of ethics 20 years ago. We're not getting the richness of the data set. So the data set you've gained is within particular ethical parameters. Yes. As you are writing these up, you are aware of many of the great conversations could have been had, but it's out in the car park. So yeah. it, it can't be had. So I, when I work with my students doing oral history and semi-structured Lorraine, mate, I get them to take really detailed notes before. So going in, how they feel, the context, the environment of the interview itself, post-interview information, really, really granular, and that's when the weaknesses start to appear. So, mm -hmm. the, you know, it's a strength because it's an ethical strength, but the challenge is you're aware of everything that could have been discussed. Yes. But but wasn't. So does that help? Intro, outro, go um, out. Methodology, yeah. note the strengths and the weaknesses of semi-structured. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I'm so grateful for that conversation Is that because, obviously, there's room to make you know, assumptions, but in actual fact, one of the assumptions I've made from some of the comments is actually completely contradictory between what some of the participants said. So I'm thinking, okay, that's my assumption, and yet I've actually got clear narrative that says, no, that's not true. So that's really making me rethink now around that, that. yeah, so thank you so much. Lorraine, really. that's, that's a gift. That's a blessing. Mm. It's one of the reasons we, we talk about positionality a lot now we talk about the lens from qual to quant because we have this lens and acknowledging that allows us to see 
I'm not seeing reality. It has a lens in front of it. So when a countervailing data set emerges, we recognize it. It's not wrong. It is dissonant with our positionality and it's been brought to light. You, you rock the rain. Should we go to our favourite, favourite human? Hello, beautiful Susan M. You're busy on multiple devices. It's so exciting. You're clearly running NASA in Jamaica. So, Susan, what were you writing on, Superstar? Uh, well, I was doing an annotated bibliography. Or was I? I was trying to. So I literally... This might be my first one trying to... Like, this is hilarious. So... I mean, no matter the climate change program I have in, so they have required me to do it. So I teach research methods and two of my co-workers convinced me like about two years ago that we should give students. And I really don't like them still. Anyway, and I've just never done it ever, but I'm now in this program where they asked me to do it. So what's funny is we also had two assignments and then work this morning I was writing on my paper without doing any annotation of what, why I need to annotate. I'm like, I read these papers, understanding them writing. But I'm like, well, they told me I must do at least three. So uh, what I just did was I just took a table in a form because like it, it, it it's like there are two different um, articles that the tables are so good that it makes sense to kind of like adapt it for my paper. But then I also need to write about it. But I'm finding this whole annotated bibliography thing to be quite puzzling to me. Like, like, why do I need to annotate? Can't I just understand, translate? Sorry, remember, I still haven't done a PhD. So Stop I am just like, Stop. if you're only going to use 30 citations, do you actually need? You know, like, sorry, like I'm not going to do this for this assignment. Yeah. But like, how yeah. valuable is this annotated bibliography thing? Yes. So look, look, Susan, I used to teach them. I used to put them as an assignment point. I know it feels like you've got your small intestine and you're pulling it slowly out of your nose. I understand that it's that level of excitement. What, what I used to teach it for is to show students that they must describe a, a reference on its own terms, but then one sentence to analyze it. So when I was teaching an annotation, they must ah. with accuracy explain what the person was saying, but then one sentence of why they said it and how it may be used. Does that help? Oh, one sentence. Wow. Yeah, yeah that does help. I like the one sentence. What I found, what, remember, I've been, I've been actually evaluating them. What I find is that the students tend to be okay with the summary, but with the analysis part, it, like many students are poor. So that's a good reminder. So thanks for that. So, so that's why we used to teach the annotated bibliography to overtly show them just a summary is not analysis. Description is mm -hmm. different from analysis. You rock, Definitely. Susan. You rock, Susan. So, you by rock. the way, I'm very excited about what I wrote this morning. So I, if you don't mind me just clicking one more minute. No, I wrote this morning about, so I met with my mentor two days ago about this project. And he he sort of I wanted to write on climate change in universities, both talking about the public health, like all this, the students in health, as well as the general like student population. And he said, No, that's too much for one thing. So I said, Okay, fine. I come in. He's trying to tell me I'm a stick to the health people. I told him, No, I'm not a health person. And in Jamaica and in the Caribbean, they don't listen to people who are not physicians. So I he didn't like me being pragmatic. I, I'm like, I'm not a 21, I told him I'm not 21. So I know I'm not a physician, so let me write who I might persuade. And then my paper is so much stronger because I even start off by saying, I think universities do three things. And by the way, I won't write on that. And it's so great because it's actually a gap in literature because it's much more written about how climate change should be taught to health professionals and much less, there actually some, much less. So I'm like, wow, I'm not only talking to Caribbean universities, I'm literally like showing my like in my writing, I'm feeling the gap. And so the paper is cool, the annotated bill is not. So I'm very excited about how this is going to go in the next two oh. months. And and we are so, excited. 
We yeah. are excited about you, Susan. You saw Doug, his eyes nearly left the left left his head there when you were talking there. So I think Doug and you might be having a chat about this shortly as well. Fantastic, mate. You're the best. Sh should we go to the light of our lives? Uh, good, good, good. Are we still morning for you, Max? Where are we? Where are we in the timeline for you, Max? What time is it? Uh, it's 10, 10, um, it's 10, 10, how do I say this? It's 10 past 10. Yes. <laughs> fantastic. You're nearly on the same time zone as us. Fantastic. So Max, what were you writing on? What are you changing the world with at the moment, Queen Max? Um, so I like public speaking, despite having high anxiety. And because I have high anxiety, I have these like checklists I often make when I do something very complicated, like having an essay or having a presentation, because I am so worried that I um, miss something that I need like a physical thing that I can verify that I did not miss anything. So I, I made this long checklist and I was just editing every item on here for language and for organization so that I can use it later. <laughs> Max, that is amazing. Are you ever going to share these these checklists with your Times Higher Education audience, Dana? Oh, oh, sure. I would love that. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Why don't we write that? I'd, lo I'd bloody love to see your checklist. Why don't we try and write that up for you, Max, and, and, and keep those articles going for you? Sure. I'd be glad. You are the best, Max. You are legendary. Should we go to our other favourite human, the legendary Adrian, who's joining us with so much glamour today in his charcoal grey top. Good morning, <laughs> sir. Now, what were you writing on this morning, brother? I need a bit of colour, don't I? Um, I was writing on, um, I'm writing my methodology chapter at the moment. And um, yeah, it's um, it's doing my head in a little bit, but I think I'm I'm kind of getting out of the woods I'm rereading it and things are kind of falling into place. So it's a very complex, I'm realizing how complex I've made this um, for myself because it's a practice led um, PhD, but it's, um, yeah. I don't know. Like I'm, I'm, yeah, I don't even want to go into it because no, I, I, <laughs> so look, many I, layers. Yeah. If, if it helps you, mate, you know, I've written a bloody book on practice led creative led methods uh, I have it. If you if if you're all oh, no, 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 no. um if <laughs> if you're all a bit tumbled up like mm. that a bit mm, that means you're doing it right. Oh good. Okay. Seriously, when you're doing practice lead and it's all very simple and let me just overshare me, have I talked about me yet? Me, you know, me. Um, and they're the very simple ones that are also wrong. So the methodology that is grinding the gears a bit, uh, 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 mm -hmm. that's exactly where you need to be, mate. Yeah, it's it's difficult because I'm using different methodologies to inform practice further. So it's a turn on itself. It's iterative, uh, yep. Yeah, and and so yeah, it's not just practice led. It's the, using a specific methodology, Talanoa, um, to inform the illustrations that I'm doing. So I'm talking about the in illustrations, and then I'm using Talanoa to inform the illustrations, and then talking about them, and then I'm using arts based research to inform the illustrations in my experience within this different culture. So yeah, it's 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 complex. So I'm thinking. Philosoph uh, philosophically, I'm I'm heading towards some sort of complex theory where I can bring that into the scheme of things too. Adrian, that's perfect. <laughs> what you've just expressed there is absolutely perfect. Well yeah. done, you. I uh, know it does your head in. That is the best analysis of practice-led iterative research I've ever heard. Keep keep going and keep in touch with us. All right. Will do. You're amazing. Now the legendary Josh. Now, now who who are you upsetting this week, Josh? So what what's our audience? What's our audience this week, Josh? I think I am going to upset a few people with this one. Um, I've just I finished a piece um, in in the thirty minutes just then. So I've got um, it's titled "Linguistic Imperialism in the Taiwanese Academy: Anglophone Faculty and Their Non Engagement with Taiwanese Scholarly Literature." <laughs> um, so it it. Yeah, it's a Taiwan context, but it touches on, um, you know, the the big issues of Western faculty getting hired with um, priority and then not engaging with local literature, not being willing to learn the language, et cetera, and just trying to create some space where we raise those expectations a bit. Um, 
and acknowledge that they probably should learn to do it. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I'm submitting it to a, a Taiwanese um, educational sociology journal, so I'll see how they take it. Um, but I spent the 30 minutes doing up the final checks in the reference list, which involved me learning how uh, Chinese characters for my Mandarin cited literature um, is alphabetically ordered or the equivalent of alphabetical ordering over here, um, which I had a few choices on, which was bizarre. Um, but yeah, so we'll Look, see how Josh, it goes. Josh, it's great for your brain. I've, I've certainly been doing some multilinguistic work recently, um, including in Arabic. And I tell you what's good for your brain. It's good if you're an international scholar, well, bring it, you know, bring it, bring it, learn something. Um, so I think that's magnificent, Josh. You you create some havoc, mate. Create some havoc. Great idea. Great idea, mate. Should we go to the legendary gay? We've missed gay the last couple of weeks. Now, gay, how, how we are we still working with our soldiers, or what are we working on now, gay? Well, it, um, I, the soldiers. I'm editing. I've got a cull three thousand word. It's currently nine thousand. I need to take it down to six. Uh, actually, yeah, and I've actually got so much material that I could probably produce a short to medium monograph at the end of it. But in the middle of the half hour, I got a phone call from um, the supervisor who had to abandon me last year when I was doing the cemeteries pro project. He yes. read and he called me to say, these are the three journals that, in order that I think you should submit it to. How how many months later, Gay? Look, he's been really, 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 really sick. Oh. He's only just back on deck. Oh. But um, and he said it's important stuff and it needs to get um published. And I'm kind of a bit thrown, but that's. Well, that's great. You deserve that, Gay. That's that's remarkable work. You deserve that, and you get that published, darling. Well Thank done, you. you. That's a positive thing for the day. That inspires us all. You are legendary. Should we, go, should we go to the wonderful Jess? Hello, Jessica. Um, you've had to you've had to put up with me a lot this week. Uh, I've felt like I've sort of been you know electronically tagging you, Jess. So so what were you writing on <laughs> during that thirty minutes, my darling? Okay, so I um, jumped in. Hi, everyone. I jumped in late this morning because I was um, presenting a workshop on some mental health stuff and I used it as a bit of a play with the workshop that I'll be creating for the PhD. Um, so I then spent, when I got back and jumped in, I've spent that time going through the feedback forms and just thinking about how I can apply that to the PhD and the workshop that I'm creating there. So, okay. and I've also, and then I was reading Goffman. Oh, Tara, that is, it's it's a hard read. He's a hard guy. I don't drink coffee, but I had one yesterday yeah. um, to just wake up. <laughs> Yes, Jess, the idea that that you stopped at coffee with Goffman, I think, is all about your level of self-control, Jess. I think that's remarkable. Most people sort of vodka their way through through Goffman, so well done. Well done. Uh, no, and it just goes so deep into all the different techniques, the observational techniques he uses, right down to the different types of nonverbal. He, he explains a wave in about four paragraphs yes. and the underlying meaning and how, oh, my goodness, I'm like, wow, I, I hope I don't have to go into this much detail. <laughs> But, but you see the granularity, the description, the participant observation for the island work. Do you see why I said, have a read? Yeah, yeah I'll get I'll get through it. Um, but that's my list of, that's what I'm doing for the rest of the day too. Very proud but, of you. Thank you. Oh, you're legendary, absolutely legendary. Should we go to our favourite historian from the People's Republic of Western Australia? We haven't talked to beautiful Mary this morning. Good morning, Mary. How are you going? Woo! Now, what are we writing on? I'm so excited I could explode. Come on, come on. Well, um, I just finished a ten-year, uh, sorry, ten-week internship um, that was paid, very generously paid too, I think. Um, and I'm finishing the report on that. So today I need to finish the report, which I've got feedback on, and then put a lot of um, other documents into PDF and attach them as appendices, and hopefully I can then submit it. Oh, that's brilliant. And, it, I mean, what sort of report is it from the internship? Is it sort of formal, this is what happened and these were the outputs? And 
Yeah, it's a little bit different to a history one. So that was a really good experience. So it's a bit more um, of a scientific type report that they wanted. So they had set headings in it. They gave us the template. Um, so they wanted uh, introduction, background, method, results, discussion and conclusion. Oh, that's not prescriptive at all, is it? <laughs> but it, it fitted in okay. And I could certainly, I, in the discussion section, I put the bit of historical stuff that I found out and they weren't expecting that, but it was a history, had a history flavour to it. So everything else was very scientific. The other nine in turn um, ship candidates were doing really scientific stuff like it was it's all visualization of research because it's they've got a lot of high-tech stuff there curved screens and 360 degree little kind of bubble room you can walk into and just um so you can visualize visualize your research they do things like visualizing maps of mars and stuff like that. other re scientific research like that being done at curtin university so a lot of them were visualising, say, the human body or one project was um, setting up a situation so that nurses who fly out to remote areas in WA, um, they had a three, 3D thing of the clinic they were going to. So all the clinics are set up the same and they have a 3D thing they can do on the plane where they actually know, where, by the end of it, they know where everything is in the clinic and how it's all set up and how it works. Mm -hmm. And then they can get off the plane and just walk into the clinic and start working without having to spend a day finding out where everything is. So a lot of the projects were really just really clever science projects like that. It was really quite inspiring to be part of it, actually. You are brilliant, Mary. I didn't know we'd be having that conversation today. Is there anything Mary can't do? And I think the answer is no. <laughs> well, I didn't do all of that. That was the other intern. So I did one on gold fields, panoramas of the gold fields in Western Australia. And then I found out some stuff about four of the main photographers who were from about eight worked from about the late 1890s to into the 1930s doing having these huge cameras that they would take around and do panoramas of landscapes that's amazing see I'd be thrilled to read that too I'm only laughing because I'm hoping one of those photographers was the guy that took the picture of the guys that found the golden eagle because I my, don't know but my grandfather was in, in that he was one of oh the, really it could yes, possibly be yeah, there were two photographers who did work in the goldfields for a long time. Two were there briefly and two had businesses taking photographs in the goldfields, like, and usually family groups and stuff like that. But every now and then they'd go out and take a panorama photo of a mine. That's fantastic. Long live Cal. Respect to all the Cal crew and Kulgardi. That is fantastic. Mary, you rock. Thank you for that. That is brilliant. Changed my life today. Should we go to our legendary Noor? who is just, hello, my queen. I'm so excited to see you. Now, what were you writing on? Now, this is going to be a major moment. Now, what's been happening, Dal? I was writing about my uh, research paper. I mean, in my supervisor. And it is related to the new research system. So that's why I also need your advice about it. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yeah. Uh, can I um, connect it? Um, I mean, when I write a research significance, what what uh, some uh, take into consideration to make it more uh, convenient? I mean, more um, more accepted to my supervisor because I think there is a problem with that. Yes. And then also, um, I'm 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 wondering about use narrative uh, um, approach. And and I will combine it with the grounded research. So can you give me a more highlight about it, Tara? Because I think you are so uh, in that area. Oh, darling, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just a random. But if you're trying to prove the case for significance, and colleagues can please help Nor as well, but significance mm -hmm. exists in, in there can be something incredibly small that's incredibly significant. Some of the easiest stuff, Nor, is about methodology. So if you're doing something really interesting in terms of methodology, uh, you know, it might be iterative or you might be taking a conventional technique and applying it to a new context, mm -hmm. a new location that significant it can also be epistemologically significant so this oh. is where the body of the research is and you are stepping us one step beyond where the consensus of this knowledge system is so if you're just stretching the knowledge system a little bit that's also significant 
And it could also be something that's timely, Noor. So mm -hmm. it could be about impact and engagement. So something that you're doing will have a real life consequence post the thesis. That can also be significant. So it can be done methodologically, epistemologically. It can be done in terms of impact and engagement and audience or changing real life practice. There's just a few options. Does that help a little bit? Yes, of course. It's really wonderful. Oh my God, oh. I love you, Tara. I love you. I love you. But, yes, but yes. darling, have a go with that and email me yes. through the weekend if there's a problem. All right. Okay. Okay. You are the best. Should we go? Should we go to? I, I describe her as my arch nemesis, but that's not true. It's the legendary Ruth. Ruth, who is the calm center of the CDU HDR program. Can't manage without <laughs> your calmness, Ruth. Good morning. What were you writing on, my queen? Oh my goodness, Tara, I'd hate to be your arch nemesis, but it does sound kind of exciting, doesn't it? It is. We're like Moriarty and Sherlock Holmes, except you're probably Sherlock Holmes and I'm Moriarty. I wouldn't mind that. That'd, that'd be good. I think we'd That's have cool. a bit of fun with that. I think we can too. <laughs> oh, um, so this morning I was writing um, a piece for one of the chapters in my thesis um, about the commercial determinants of health. So um, if you don't know what the commercial determinants of health are, it's about sort of the high level what ha, how commercial entities impact our health so rather than saying why do you smoke why can't you quit why do you drink why do you eat bad food what's wrong with the system that um means that the environment that we live in means that you know poor quality foods are more easily accessible and alcohol is really easily accessible so it's about what's wrong with the system rather than what's wrong with the person Ruth, I mean, that's brilliant. And you know, when I arrived in Darwin, I'm, we've talked about this, I was sort of stunned that I saw tobacconists. I haven't seen tobacconists since the 70s, right? Right. And so like in, in the People's Republic of Western Australia, but and I'm walking in a shopping centre in Darwin and they're a tobacconist, right? So that's a great example about a public health determinant, isn't it? But mm. Ruth, I'm also thinking, you know, remember George Orwell wrote about this where he argued why poor crew, crew, working class crew, but also crew in poverty, eat bad food. And his argument was in 1932 that people eat poor food because their life is debilitating. So all they want, quite rightly, is something a little bit sweet that punctuates their life to give them something to look forward to. And that was George Orwell mm. you know, just after the Great Depression. So this is a powerful yeah. argument, mate. And it's easy and it's cheap. And when you've got a lot of other life stresses, it's just, yeah. So it's about, you know, what can we do to change to change the, the profits over people mentality? I want to be you, but you know, <laughs> I want to be you in a non stalky way. <laughs> Thank you for everything you do, Ruth. You are changing the world. We've probably got time for two more people. Can I go to beautiful Susan L? Because Susan is so inspiring to us and I get chills and I feel so inspired to go on with my day after I hear from Susan. So, Susan, what were you writing on? Well, what I was doing, the the uh, article that I've been working on about women's names and so on. Yes. Uh, what I had been, what I was writing was um, notes about how I wanted structured, how I wanted structured, and then some notes about other about examples to include evidence to use um and then i got some ideas about how to change the tone because remember i was saying that you know i was using foul language and all this other so i got some advice about how to change the tone without ruining the argument yes yeah so what i did was i made a revised structure so all i have to do when we finish to my, you know, my tomorrow mm. is to just go through and rearrange and do that sort of thing. Oh, Susan, we are we are thrilled. That is just so we just Susan, we adore you. And next call we'll talk about Susan that that advice and what they they advised you about managing language because I've got a few PhD students that have got some robust language from their from their participants, and I have an argument about. You know, they probably need to, for the efficacy and, and transparency, show that language. But I'll, I'll get that advice off you next week if I can. You're amazing. And and look, Susan, we'll finish as we always do. I didn't know if Dina had come, if she was just going, can this woman leave me alone now? But our finisher, who has finished, um, has finished. Oh, Lorraine, you want to speak, Lorraine? Talk to me, Lorraine. Yeah, 
Do I talk? No, to actually, Jen did. I saw Jen putting a hand up. So I was. I'm just. Oh, just Jen! I didn't. I didn't. You, Jen. I, I didn't see Jen's hand up. Where's? No, me? I know because sometimes the screen you don't get everyone. So they, I'm they're... so sorry, Jen. Do you want to say hello, Jen? Say hi. Hi. Actually, I put my hand up because I was going to say, I was just was going to ask Susan, like. How did you know that the sentiment or the tone of your paper was wrong? Yeah. And is there a process for fixing that? But then, Tara, you said, oh, I'll let you talk about that next week. Oh, no, would well, Susan, please please answer the wonderful Jen. How do you know that there's a tone issue? God, I'd love to know that. I've, I've moved through 55 years atonal, mate. Susan, wh what was the tone variable? Because when I read academic articles, they tend to be very formal, um very to the point very direct when i write i tend to be very informal even though i'm direct you know and all of that and i don't when i write i don't have trouble writing you know i don't have writer's block i don't get that i just write and i use my own voice as i write but my voice is great for um, um popular material it's not necessarily the best voice for academic material, which is what I've been trying to write. So I got some advice about how to change and let the tone of my writing match an academic audience. That's that's amazing, Susan. Since Susan's such a great writer, Jen, that she can move the modalities. Also, Jen, this weird software called Pro Writing Aid also does a diagnostic on your tone, on your style, if you'd like to see what that's like. So that's an option. So thank you, Susan. Thank you, wonderful. Jen, that's amazing. And Dina, so Dina is here. Uh, Dina will finish us off. Now, I thought didn't know if Dina would be here. She's here, and obviously I've thrown her towards a conference. So I just went, Dina, do a conference. And unbelievably, she's gone, I will do a conference. Dina, what were you writing on during Write Club? Um, that's actually what I'm uh, preparing for. So I, I've been doing my presentation. That's my uh, pre doing presentation is my weaknesses because I can't. I I have um, difficulties in shorten um, the writings and just put it into bullet points. So yeah, um, presentation is um, it's 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 actually very hard for me. <laughs> so I'm doing it little by little. Dina, that is wonderful, and your old supervisor can do a mock with you so you can present to an audience of one, and I'll be enthusiastic, I promise. Thank you. Well done, Dina. I'm so thrilled with your colleagues. What a brilliant, magnificent morning. I wish you all well. Have a wonderful week. Linda, we love you. Sleep well. Wonderful Susan L. Sleep well. Our two Susans sleep well. See you next week. Bye-bye. Linda, you're the best. See you, my darling. Take care, beautiful. Bye-bye. Fantastic.